Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. We often complain that the media in Wales is massively focused on the British state in London without reporting much on Wales or Scotland. But considering how deep and close the Welsh links are with Ireland in terms of trade and culture, it is surprising that we know so little about the political landscape in Ireland. Well, as a podcast committed to educating, elevating and occasionally entertaining, we're delighted to be joined by Cardiff-based researcher Lila Haynes. Lila has just written a book, Radicals and Realists, Political Parties in Ireland, published by the Welsh Academic Press. That is a great overview of the politics of our neighbours to the West. Hello, Lila. Hello. Lovely to be with you. No, thank you so much for joining us. So I thought the easiest question to start with is, what was your reason for writing the book? Aha. The, the political reason, the serious reason, is that I have been increasingly in despair almost at how little people know about Ireland and, and at the level of political error into which people can fall. So now that I'm uh, at a stage of life when I have a little more time, I was getting seriously into informing myself in order to see if I had anything to say to anybody else. And then came COVID. So this very seriously was my project during a lockdown project, if you like, pandemic project. I just was able to actually get stuck in, get, get on with the job. In terms of how I did it and the sources and all that sort of thing, anyone who looks at the book will see that it is replete with a huge number of references, which I hope will be of use to anybody who feels like taking any aspect of it further. And there are so many aspects I could have taken further, dug deeper into, etc. I had to be very choosy. I needed to make it structure it in such a way that it will, would be easy for anyone in a hurry or anyone with varying amounts of prior knowledge to, to make use of it. Hence the Ireland in 12 parties approach. I was just going to go on to that. So you've picked 12 political parties. And you've used this terminology in the book, so for the purpose of this part, I'll do the same, from Northern Ireland and from also the Republic of Ireland. What made you pick the parties that you did? Some of it was absolutely obvious. As I was looking at the politics of modern Ireland, I had to start with the Irish Parliamentary Party, which began to take form in the uh, 1870s, but became a force in the land in, and in Westminster in the early 1880s under the leadership of Charles Stuart Parnell. And from that party, the first Home Rule Bill for Ireland, or for any part of what used to be the Union of Britain and Ireland, was presented to Parliament, to the Westminster Parliament in 1886, defeated in the Commons because a lot of Liberals at the time uh, were unionists as well and defected, if you like, uh, to the, the Tory side uh, when it came to a vote. The next party, and they come in sequence of foundation date in, in this book, uh, the next uh, party I chose without any hesitation was what became the Ulster Unionist Party. There wasn't that initially. Um, the unionists were campaigning to keep the entirety of Ireland as part of the union. That effectively arose in response to um, and to fight back against the Home Rule movement. Parallel, if you like, with those two great nationalist and unionist foundational parties, the Labour movement was beginning to emerge, but very, very slowly and very tentatively for quite a long time. But eventually, around about the time uh, just before partition of the island, the Labour Party, as it became, um, was, was emerging from its initial infancy and coming together in something that was actually quite was feared by, by the establishment in London as something more dangerous in 1919 than the, the nationalist movement, which is quite ironic uh, in, in many ways. It was obviously influenced by what was happening in Russia and elsewhere in, in Europe, and uh, it, that changed with time, but we don't want to go into too much detail at this stage. And so you had there the three foundational parties, if you like, of the main um, threads of politics on the island of Ireland, nationalist, unionist and Labour. The fourth in the chronology is Sinn Féin, but readers may be quite surprised at what a varied and a, a interesting bunch of people um, that was, far, far different in its, in its initial stage from what we now know as Sinn Féin, what I call the current holders of that title. It had some Welsh influence in its foundational phase, 
because Arthur Griffith was of Welsh descent, um, the name might give, give away the game, and he grew up in poverty, great poverty actually, in, in Dublin. His father was a printer, but actually at one stage actually lived in a, in a poor house. There were I think times were so bad. He gave his life for Ireland in a very real sense. He totally dedicated himself to trying to find ways of winning independence. But uh, he was one of he was one of the early realists, uh, as I kind of came to know them. He was an, a separatist, but he knew that uh, most Irish people at the time were not. So he came up with what he thought were ways of persuading them. He was willing to recognise the Crown of England in order if that was could be a stepping stone towards independence. And he wasn't the only one. Others before him, like the great Daniel O'Connell, who's you know, who was held up to me as a child growing up in the Republic as the great liberator. <laughs> People like that so re re realised that reality back then. Anyway, so that's the kind of beginning. The others would be harder for, perhaps I had harder choices to make occasionally for the others of, of the, the dozen. I chose Clon Publicta, party of the, the our family of the Republic, as the mid-century key party. It wasn't that it ever became big, but it became very influential for a short period of time. And that was the, the they formed the, they formed part of the first ever coalition government in Ireland and were influential on the declaration of a republic. But it for people like me growing up then, and I, I remember for my parents in particular, other things they did were much more important. I grew up in a nice house because of that coalition government. They, they tackled the housing problems. They tackled the TB, which was absolutely rampant in Ireland. And I single out in that particular chapter, somebody called uh, Noel Brown, Dr. Noel Brown, who had TB himself. Both, he lost both his parents and most of his siblings to TB. And he knew what to do because by a strange series of lucky chances, he was trained as a doctor and he focused on on trying to solve what was the great social problem and health problem of that time. So at that, that sort of, at that stage, in between, of course, I haven't mentioned Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, which split from one of the early manifestations of Sinn Féin, uh, fought a civil war and were considered to be enemies for the rest of that century until uh, two years ago, they formed a coalition with the Green Party. So times are changing. <laughs> Then, of course, you've got the whole, um, sorry to, to go on, rather long answer to this particular question. But of course, what was happening in Northern Ireland was complete hegemony by the Unionist Party for about 50 years. Then, after the civil rights movement became active and was brutally attacked, the uh, other parties began to be formed. The Alliance Party first, and very shortly afterwards, the Social Democratic and Labour Party, uh, which both offered what you would call non-sectarian. I suppose that's the, the, the really outstanding characteristic of both of them. They were both attempted to be non-sectarian, to break the old divide between Catholic, Protestant, Unionist, Nationalist. And they unfortunately perhaps um, found it hard going. Then the, the great radical of the, of the right, <laughs> Dr. Ian Paisley, with all his Welsh connections too, <laughs> founded the Democratic Unionist Party. So you get the idea. So you mentioned that that general election of 1874 is a rather influential moment in, in Irish political history. But let's look a little bit before that. What was Ireland's political party maker prior to that election? Well, it's hard to say that there were any par political parties per se in, in the modern sense of it. The Irish Parliamentary Party is widely recognised as being the, the first modern political party, possibly in the British Isles, not just in, in Ireland, uh, because of the, I won't even attempt to go into the sort of back history of the, the two main parties on, on the island of Britain, but as you know, they had deep roots. Uh, so before that, you had political movements more than political parties. In the early part of the 19th century, there was the movement led by Daniel O'Connell, first for Catholic emancipation, and the fact that Catholics were allowed to sit in parliament after the Catholic Emancipation Act, it meant that O'Connell and others of a like mind were able to get elected, and it was they had thirty something, I think, elected first time in first election following Catholic emancipation, and they formed an Irish bloc and attempted to have um, some sort of Home Rule bill passed, but failed miserably. On, on not surprisingly, given the time it was, 
uh, there had been uprisings uh, in following the the Act of Union that demolished the old Irish Parliament, which was hardly a parliament in a modern sense, but it was a parliament. And uh, like Scotland, it was said that the, the votes that... Uh, that had demolished that parliament were bought, but that's a whole other story, which doesn't form much of a part in my, it doesn't play much of a role in my, my particular sto- set of stories here. So let's get on to those stories. What sort of impact would you say the creation of the Irish Parliamentary Party had on the politics of Ireland? Well, for me, the fascinating thing is that it wasn't just parliamentary activity, and they were good at that, and they definitely made their presence felt, and they used tactics that like kind of filibustering in order to constantly have um, attention drawn to to the uh, problems of Ireland. But they also perfected pretty well the idea of mass agitation. O'Connell had done it with his mass meetings, both for Catholic emancipation and afterwards for, for repeal of the Union. But they brought together this parliamentary force and the mass agitation around the social issues of the day. And the big one there was land. Most people working the land in Ireland and most people worked on the land in some way or another were tenant farmers with no security of tenure. The Land League had already begun to to, um, be active, but Parnell and Michael Davitt of the Land League formed this alliance that turned out to be hugely influential, uh, hugely popular and gave the men from the hills, the old Fenians, the old armed forces guys, away into parliamentary uh, politics as well. So you have the beginning there, by the way, of what has become a trend uh, uh, in Irish history where the, the the people who espouse armed action eventually give up their guns and take their place in. In democracy. So the outcome of that particular alliance was to start the breakdown of the old colonial land ownership system. And that was incredibly, um, incredibly influential across the island and probably further afield. It was it was a big success. How similar were their calls for home rule to what we would now understand as devolution? Now that's a really great question. <laughs> Let me pause. <laughs> <laughs> there were similarities, and to be honest, the, when the third Home Rule Bill was finally passed in 1912, it was quite a weak document, really, quite a weak settlement, and it wasn't an awful lot different to, to what Wales got in 1999, 1998, 1999. One of the things I've done in my checkered life is to have worked in the um, well, uh, National Assembly of Wales in at, at its foundation, and it was always a constant struggle to find things you could actually do without being dumped upon by somebody in London. Um, to me, that there is a lot of similarity between the devolution Wales got and the devolution that was on offer in 1912 and eventually completely passed through the system by 1914, but didn't ever get implemented because of um, the war, First World War. So they didn't have, they didn't, that third home rule bill didn't actually offer what you'll call control over finances, and that was a big deal. Though the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, members of the time continued to hope that before long they would win that right. And I guess so sort of went along the same path as we've been going along here in Wales or in Scotland of hoping for incremental improvements, uh, except that that's not what happened. (laughs) So I wanted to talk for a moment about the Labour Party. So in the, in the 1918 general election, they, they stood aside in Ireland, that, allowing that election to act as, I think you call it a, a plebiscite in the, in the book, uh, on independence. Yes. Uh, how different would you say the constitutional attitudes of the Labour Party in 1918 were to the Labour Party that we know in the UK of 2022? Wow, now that's a set, that, that really is a good question. Um, I don't know how... You'd have to differentiate between the Labour Party uh, uh, overall, the, the, the British Labour Party, uh, and that in Wales, Scotland's a different matter, so you stick to Wales. I think that there are a lot more people in today's Labour Party in Wales who see a greater self-determination for Wales as a perfectly acceptable, plausible and desirable aim than there were 20 years ago at the beginning when we got devolution first. I think it's generational to a large degree. It's also probably a case of the reasoned approach winning out. Um, 
experience suggesting that they really do need to get something an awful lot stronger than we were first offered. Um, people like Mark Drakeford, who's, in my opinion, one of the most thoughtful people in, in Welsh politics, but also can be quite cautious when he knows there's not much point in going um, head on against something. Yeah, people like that are now leading the party, plus, as I say, that younger generation. So that, me, that to me suggests that there was a certain amount of similarity between today's Labour Party in Wales, but not England's Labour Party necessarily, which is very, very, very much more an umbrella organisation than, than, than most, that with the Labour Party in Ireland in the, at the time of independence, we call it that, in the Republic, but it was also a very militant party in, in Ireland at the time, North and South. You know that North East Ireland around Belfast was particularly, you know, benefited from the union in that there was a great deal of industry, they had a petty market, big industries, big heavy industries. Uh, so you had the, the unionization of that kind of industry had happened or was happening. But that didn't mean that people were automatically all on the side of the workers, as opposed to their Catholic tradition or their Protestant tradition, and that's a whole other story. So overall, it's not possible any more than it's possible to draw a complete parallel between Ireland and Wales, to say that there's an obvious parallel between Labour in Wales at any given time and Labour in Ireland at any given time. Right now, however, <laughs> uh, Labour in Ireland is incredibly weak, probably at its lowest point in its history, and Labour in Wales continues to be strong. Let's take another party, for example, then. So the Labour, the Labour Party's sister party, the Social Democratic and Labour Party, mm -hmm. also has a radically different constitutional view to the UK party. Mm -hmm. um, can, can, can this be rationalised in comparison their very, with their very unionist British equivalent? You know, you've seen comments from Keir Starmer in the last year or two about if there was a border poll, the UK Labour Party would still campaign for... Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. It seems like a weird contradiction that these parties can coexist, even if it is in sister party status. Yeah, yeah no, that's. I, I think that Keir Starmer would find it very difficult to gather his perfect uh, set of members if he should he wish to uh, re-establish the British Labour Party within Northern Ireland. The Labour, both Labour and Nationalist. Um, Labour leaning and nationalist leaning people in Northern Ireland basically kept their heads down for an awful lot of the first half of the 20th century. And the neither of them was ever particularly influential, I think, from that possibly the best that Northern Ireland Labour ever did was about four members of the Stormont um, uh, uh, Parliament. The nationalist side was very um, fragmented and has been described by some as being just a set of um, fiefdoms. But they found common ground. And that's maybe a lesson to us that people often have more in common than the loudest spokespersons for any particular party are ever willing to admit in public. So when the SDLP was founded, it was in order to avoid descent into chaos, to quote uh, one of the founding members, Jerry Fitt, at, uh, at its launch. It looked as if, and they were right, Chaos was on on the horizon, and it was going to going to be very tough indeed on the the ordinary population. So they were able to set aside enough of their differences to form that party at a time point of, in time that was an emergency. But it wasn't always possible to keep on the same page. So I have, I think, ref, um, suggested in my epilogue that if it came to the push. You, and the SDLP had to choose between being joining with a nationalist or a Labour Party anywhere, really. That's not what I say, but this is what I think. Um, then it would split the party again, because there is enough difference between the two main strands, which is social democratic. There, that's what holds it together, social democracy. There is a commitment to that. But some of the leading founders of the party... Uh, particularly Jerry Fitt, perhaps, found it very difficult to put up with this idea that nationalism had to be um, part of their agenda. So, yeah, it was 
quite a quite a complex scenario that they managed very well and and you know you can't but admire even no matter how um, analytical and cold I, I I was while while working my way through the evidence there were points in time when I found myself saying God how do they do it how do they keep on going in in you know when they were being attacked. When, when their families, their staff, whatever, were, were, were under attack from both the, the provosts and the, the loyalists, how do they keep on going? And they did. They, with the, the, in cooperation with David Trimble, were instrumental in getting to the point where a peace accord could be signed. That's not to say that others were not, didn't have to take incredibly big steps forward as well, but it was the constant pushing from the likes of John Hume that ended the conflict. It is interesting, isn't it, that social democracy point you make, uh, Lila, because some would say that the modern Lib Party in Wales has this sort of duality of being some of it, some of its members being pushed towards more nationalist sentiment, more towards more unionist settlement, but it does seem to be that social democracy that sort of keeps them all together no matter where they go on the constitution. Yeah, I think you're probably right on that. Uh, and I think this is, is something that cropped up for me quite frequently during my research on, on, on for this book, democracy in its various forms at per points in time was the absolutely pivotal issue. You know, you have the 1918 election, first one in which women could vote, the first one in which poorer men could vote. And that's when the Sinn Féin breakthrough, and we could talk about what that really meant, but anyway, when the nationals breakthrough through happened, and that led to the breaking away and setting up of a, an independent parliament in Dublin. Um, but that particular election was pivotal. So it was an election that was pivotal, not the 1916 rising, despite its place in folk memory. It, there were other times, referendum, jump forward nearly a century, the referendum um, in North and the one South, both of them, particularly maybe the one in South, because the, in, 1998 to ratify the um, peace accord, uh, the Republic of Ireland gave up a lot in terms of its traditional claims to unification of the island and parked it. And most people recognized and respected the democratic wish of the people north and south for peace and the building of a new democratic parliament and way of being in Northern Ireland that followed from that, jumping forward a few more decades, the, the social changes in, in, in the Republic were marked by referenda, the, the equal marriage, as it was called, referendum, the right to divorce, the right to abortion. These rights, which are milestones in the modernization of Ireland, were possible because of democratic decisions taken by the population at large, not by any elite group of gunmen or whatever. <laughs> Building on some things you said then, I think if you asked our listeners to name Irish political parties, Sinn Féin would probably be fairly high up that list. But mm -hmm. the Sinn Féin of today is very different to the one that was, as you said, quite dominant for a short time in a post-independence mm -hmm. Ireland. Would you be able to explain briefly to us what happened to that version of the party mm. and how it became the, the one we know today? Well, luckily for, for readers, <laughs> for potential readers, I've provided a very nice little chart which sets out the what actually happened. To begin with, I mentioned Arthur Griffith earlier on, the original Sinn Féin uh, arose from an, as through amalgamations of various other groups he had started, he had founded and others, and it was looking for effectively a fairly advanced form of home rule. Then the a sort of accidental PR coup happened after the 1916 rising, the media and others began to call the rebels Sinn Féiners, whereas Sinn Féin, the party, had not had anything to do with that particular rebellion. So they were handed this new uh, brand on a plate <laughs> and the, the post, the, after the, the rebellion, De Valera and Collins and other well-known names were, among, were amongst those who were imprisoned and came out and decided they had to start afresh in a different kind of a way. So they took on, they took over Sinn Féin. That was the Sinn Féin that set up the breakaway parliament, that was involved through the IRA of the time in the 
a fight for independence, but then slaughtered one another in a, a civil war. So you've got that break there. And then what remained, the rump Sinn Féin of the time, basically did nothing for a few decades. There was the occasional outbreak of violent action. Then in the 60s, some of the remnants and younger people in it that remained in that rump Sinn Féin began to look for a, a reason to, to be a raison d'etre. They began um, social agitation, and that's what I, that's what I remember, you know, as a teenager. So across the board of social issues like housing, the right to fisheries, the right to this, the right to that, immigrants' rights, the civil rights movement was involved. With, they were many of the people who started that social agitation approach uh, in the old, in the Sinn Féin IRA of the time were involved in the um, civil rights movement in the north as well, and then everything exploded. And in 1970, January 1970, and I was there, I witnessed it, the, what was at the time, right-wing, military-minded people led a walkout from the Sinn Féin Ardèche and be, formed what became known as the Provisional Sinn Féin, parallel to Provisional IRA, which had already been formed weeks earlier. And that's the grouping that effectively, it, from which, Today's Sinn Féin is, is descended. However, they've changed colours in, in many ways. Well, of course, because this party is one that looks like it, well, subject to an, another election and potentially even another election in the North, could very well be the, the most, the, well, the largest party on in both Northern Ireland and the Republic. It's yeah. certainly possible. I don't know if you've noticed that it, the latest poll published over the weekend um, suggested that not only had the rise in the Republic stalled, it had also fallen back four points, which is checked again, flash, of course, depending on um, many factors. Yeah, it does look as if it's on the way to being that. Uh, at the moment, I could say that probably in the polls, the opinion polls, it already can they claim to being the, the strongest party on the island, but it's hard to form a government in Ireland, north or south. What's happened in, in, in PR terms, really, that's allowed this, this party that has such deep links with the Troubles mm. to now be in a position where mainstream Ireland is willing to elect them? Younger mainstream Ireland, uh, part of it is just a lack of historic memory. Uh, part of it is just an amazing PR job. Part of it is the, their ability to focus in a very disciplined way on what they want talked about. They're willing to, and have done in, in a number of recent cases, to sue, to take the media, to sue, to take act, legal action if they don't like what's been said about them. They've been able in the North during the lockdowns to get away with having holding funerals that were basically would have been illegal. Anyone else would have got arrested for. So they are in a very powerful position. They're very disciplined. A lot of older people still have serious doubts about their um, whether or not, to what extent they can be trusted to be as democratic as most people really prefer. You know, the Irish, the Irish electorate in the, in the Republic is basically centre left, centre right, not extreme. One could talk about issues they've, um, that the current Sinn Féin has um, espoused and might, one might, looking at it from abroad, might be a little surprised that the environment, for example, featured very little, but they held their Ordesh just a few weeks ago and seem to have suddenly discovered the environment. Um, <laughs> so that's something that has been noted as missing and has been sorted. <laughs> um, or we're, maybe not, you know, it's it's been, been hard to judge going on what is available because, of course, for the modern part of the, this book and for my cautious attempt at some sort of forecasting, I could only go on either my contacts and discussions I could have with family and friends or what's in the media. And one of the things I had to do in the end was just stay off social media because that was incredibly confusing. You know, the, the battles, the, the keyboard warriors sounded like modern versions of um, uh, community bullies, you know, uh, in a way that I felt was warping my ability to judge any of the current parties, but in particular Sinn Féin. One just has to hope that they may have become another party that has learned the hard way that the parliamentary road is the only one that you can be on for the long term. 
the two dominant forces in Irish politics post the the, the splits in, in Sinn Féin have been Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Mm-hmm. Now, whilst you're probably going to chuckle at this, most people in Britain <laughs> would view these parties as, as two sides of the same coin, although we know that's very much not the case. Um, would you be able to explain their differences and explain why they you think they've been so dominant in Ireland? Do you know, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think they've ever been that different. Um, to begin with, yes, I suppose it was very basic to begin with. First of all, it was the case of, have you, have you got all we want we were fighting for? And those who thought no, eventually for, ended up in Fianna Foil and Rump Sinn Féin, and those who thought that they had something they could build on, and it was better to take it and run with it and improve it, basically ended up in Fine Gael. That's the rough and ready sort of guide to them. Then you have the class, the class issue. Landowners tended to vote Fine Gael. Uh, Fianna Foil was very popular amongst the working classes of Ireland for a very long time, and some of their early literature could have come out of the current Trotsky's press, frankly. <laughs> but, you know, time changed that. So that's it. They became they, they became more right of centre, left of centre. But in under the Hawhey period in particular, by the 80s anyway, long, no, before that, but over time, Fine Gael became what we call the party of the Gombean men. The Gombean men were the... Um, you know, the small shopkeepers, the small business people, that sort of thing, they tended to be with uh, Fianna Foyle as well. But it was never as straightforward as that. And there were times when people you would think of as na- natural Labour voters were definitely voting Fianna Foyle. A lot of them even voted for the Progressive Democrats in their short period in, of existence. But they were a force in moving Irish um, policies towards the neoliberal right. It's a confusing scenario. So when I say I I, um, I disagree with you, I think it's never, it, there is no point in Irish political history that is simple. Well, I was going to say, because Fianna Fáil are now have an agreement with the SDLP, don't they? They, they, they have, yes. Um, it not as much came but as was, was expected, and it nearly split the SDLP at the time. Yeah, it was policy. It was a sort of policy accord, and the SDLP were quite influential on some some aspects of the Irish government's policy as a result of that. In particular, the shared island, not shared Ireland, shared island initiative. Uh, there's some uh, whole depo- uh, unit within the Department of the Teacher of the Prime Minister's Office that's responsible for reaching out and talking to bring about understanding between North and South and between communities and so on, and putting real money into projects. How important was this first coalition between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil in, in 2020? 2020, oh, hugely. Uh, you know, the significance of the two enemies from the Civil War coming together again 100 years later was, like, in Irish terms, unbelievable. And if, if Sinn Féin hadn't had that boost in 2020, in the 2020 election, then it probably would, might not have happened because we'd had a series of coalitions, mostly led by Fine Gael and mostly part, in which Fine Gael was mostly part, partnered by Labour and people to, further to the left. And we'd had some Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil-led coalitions and that had been the norm for quite a long time. But the idea that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael could become a coalition seemed beyond the ken for, for most people in Ireland until it happened. And it mightn't have happened if it wasn't for the Green Party. And I think it's important that we mention that. Uh, I end my list of 12 with the Green Party because it's the party that's looking to the future in a way that hasn't been done by any of the others up to now. And is having this time round is is quite influential. It must be quite hard sometimes, given the sort of Ireland is still realistically quite a new country in, yeah. in its legal terms. That is there a tendency of of some political parties just to fight old battles rather than to have that future that future is future looking the case up to recently to very recently. Uh, the two thousand and eight financial crash was a wake up call. I'm not saying things were static, but there was just that assumption that there were different sides of the divide and they always would be, and they would often just throw insults at one another. But this century, 
is, is seeing something new happening. It's not quite clear what yet. Future historians <laughs> uh, will have great fun with it. Not that I'm calling myself an historian per se. I'm I'm a researcher. I'm an analyst. I'm a, an ex-journal, <laughs> but. Uh, I thought this the stories were worth telling, you know. I really wanted to open up some possible new ways of looking at Ireland for people. I wanted to touch a bit on Northern Ireland, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Most, if not all of our listeners will know about the petition of the island, but would mm. you be able to explain a little about the party political background that led to the formation of Northern Ireland? Yes. I tried to keep it as briefer than I've been doing everything else. <laughs> Yeah, the, I, I said earlier on that the, what became the Ulster Unionist Party arose in opposition to, to Home Rule. During First World War, after the Home Rule Bill had been passed, the very charismatic leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, uh, Carson, became part of Lloyd George's war cabinet, effectively. And uh, the nationalist leader, unfortunately, as it turned out, for his party, um, declined the opportunity to be part of that. So Carson became much more influential. And he didn't want partition, but partition was what became the only option for unionists. The man, Carson then stood down, went to the Lords, and um, the, the, the guy who led, took over from him, was um, much, uh, how should I say, he had no scruples. He was a whiskey millionaire who was had yet had these real, really extremely religious Protestants on his in his amongst his backers. Anyway, they managed to have to, to divide the country in a way that guaranteed a unionist majority in the northeast corner. There was a careful sectarian headcount, but also it very quickly brought in things like uh, changes in the electoral system that made it a lot easier to have. Uh, union is selected and keep it that way for the best part of 50 years and disc discrimination against Catholics in various um, forms was was normal until the Civil Rights Association came along. So that's the backstory in a nutshell. Again so obviously there was a there was a devolved parliament in Northern Ireland. Ah uh, yes of course. Yeah. But 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 how, how would you compare again I've asked you that question with, with mm. the plans for home rule how would you compare that parliament to what we now experience in, in Scotland and Wales. It wasn't bad at all uh, in ter their terms of what they had. To me, though, um, not just the constitutional dimension of it, and the, the fact that they had home rule, fairly strong home rule in Northern Ireland, even though they'd post home rule for Ireland, they, they ended up making the most of it, you know, and, and they had got reasonably strong base on which to do that. However, what they didn't count on was finding out that the economic base of that northeast corner wasn't as strong as have been assumed. So those, as we know, big heavy industries can very easily crum crumble very fast once they begin to go. Once the economic basis for heavy industry is no longer as stable as it was, then you, you begin to run into trouble. So the Northern Ireland state has been effectively subsidized heavily throughout its existence from London. So that has a lot of implications. One of the very interesting things I, I discovered for the first time while reading your book was that um, the leader of Northern Ireland was called a, a prime minister. But why yes. do you think this title is not carried on into modern devolution? Uh, into modern Northern Ireland? Well, well Mo modern devolution. Modern, yeah, modern devolution. Oh, possibly a, 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 a better understanding of uh, how powerful a term it is. First minister just isn't quite the same, is it? No, this is this is why we get away with it with Plea for Need Dog. It's fine. We've got a we've got yeah. a good get out of jail yeah. card there. Right. <laughs> so obviously in, in modern Northern Ireland, post signing of the, the Good Friday Agreement, you have a period where you've got the SDLP and the UUP uh working together in the uh, as the is the largest parties in the executive. But now you I think you could make the argument that the more extreme versions of nationalism and unionism are the parties that are the most dominant, so the DUP and Sinn mm -hmm. Féin. But why do you think that is? Why do you think that people have, even though as the country appeared for a long time to be getting more moderate on the question of unification, why do you think that those more extreme parties came to the fore? I think for different reasons, perhaps on both sides. Um, in the case of Sinn Féin, they had really cemented their place in the communities. The fact that they were associated with the protectors of the Catholic community as as, as they were seen, was part of it. 
but people wanted peace and they gave them peace. They they laid, you know, they they disarmed and therefore they were kind of forgiven, I suppose. It was different on the unionist side. Trimble and the UUP were, were portrayed as having sold out the unionist Protestant communities. So I hate I always hate using the term Protestant because frankly, they're not as religious <laughs> all these days, <laughs> but there we are. And there are many, there are you know, several denominations within Protestantism, so it's, it's more complex. And, and the sheer force of personality of, of Ian Paisley, the late Dr. Ian Paisley, was a huge factor. Both of those parties were, I, I used the term disciplined before, but ruthless comes into it as well. They didn't sort of stop to think about whether or not this would be a nice thing to do, you know? Uh, we, we kind of in Wales, we, we often expect our politicians to be polite and caring. We often accuse them of not being, which, <laughs> but, but there is that expectation. And the um, SDLP and the current manifestation of the UUP are much closer to our kind of um, idea of what politicians ought to be than the, the two more extreme parties, I think. And it can work like it or not. Uh, would you describe the Northern Irish experience of cross-community power sharing as successful? In, what, in some terms, yes. It's kept the peace on the whole. There's the occasional you know, flare up, but they tend to be very minor. It hasn't been successful in evening up for too much of the community. And I know a lot of um, the DUP support comes from people within communities that feel very left behind. The young people who took part in those riots in 2000, Easter 2021 mostly came from very underprivileged backgrounds, didn't see much future for themselves. And they are kind of obvious targets for anyone who has, shall we say, um, aims for the future, which might not all be totally democratic. So the cannon fodder sort of approach to, to young people. If there had, if a lot more had been done for to raise up the opportunity to improve the opportunities for young Protestants, then I would say that it had been a lot more successful. But in that sort of way, it hasn't. Part of it is the the, the fact that the power sharing actually does ask a lot of, of everybody involved. But it also um, it also leaves out what is a growing sector of society. The shock, the real shock of the last elections earlier this year in Northern Ireland was uh, how well the Alliance Party did, and the Alliance Party and others who are not who are who don't identify as nationalist or unionist are now about twenty percent of the electorate. So you've got two um, major threads, though not parties. There's more than one party in each: unionist and nationalist, roughly speaking, uh, about forty percent each, just over forty percent each, and this third. Um, wave of uh, voters increasing in number and coming from both sides of the old divide who just are saying a plague on all your houses. We we do want to be listened to and we do want something something different, but they haven't got a place within the, the system that was set uh, up onto the peace agreement. Part of the argument around this says, look, you know, leave it be. It's working well enough. Let's not start messing around and things could get worse. Another part, and possibly from a more democratic and less fearful point of view, is it is time somehow or other to start taking a look at details of the peace agreement that regarding the structure that's in place in Northern Ireland, that exists in Northern Ireland. I wouldn't, for example, say, oh, we need to dump it and start again. But I would suggest probably that um, it's time to, at the very least, set up a commission, <laughs> as uh, politicians tend to like doing, to look at how you could amend it enough to make it a democratically more even playing field. The independence debates in, in Wales and Scotland have developed quite significantly in the last decade or so. What do you think that the political parties in Wales and Scotland could learn from political parties in a post-independence age Ireland? And do you think there would be much of an impact on our current political structures the current political parties, if they were, if Wales and Scotland were to become independent? The first thing to say is that the countries are hugely different. Not just that the histories are different, but there are enormous differences that don't make any anything 
uh, don't make it possible, don't make it likely that anything can be just transferred from one country to another. Um, my take on it would be that people who favour independence in Wales or Scotland ought to be looking at the positives, trying to find out what could be done if they had independence, as opposed to saying, give us independence and we decide what to do. Um, what really matters is independence. Uh, I'm not going to make myself popular perhaps when I say this, but <laughs> uh, I do find that a little, somewhat shallow as a, an approach. Uh, when I was involved in Welsh politics, I was involved on a policy level. Uh, and I, I almost look back at a golden age in the early period of the assembly when everybody was trying to actually come up with policies. <laughs> However, we are where we're at um, and it's not impossible that Scotland at least will um, move towards something so close to, so, so like independence that it hardly matters what you call it. And Wales will move, will change, nothing static in politics as in life. And I think it's better for it to look at two things. One is what you can do with independence, but the other is, I think this is what you're getting at, the, the actual constitutional makeup of um, the island of Ireland to see what you, you could glean from it. Uh, I think in answer to your last question, I talked about the, the deficits, the, the failings within the Northern Ireland settlement and learning from that is perhaps the, the learnings from that are not all that applicable because we already have got you know totally open system in in Wales, uh, even if I don't particularly think that first past the post is the most democratic. So I would suggest that looking at the um, single transferable vote, which is the is used both north and south except for uh, the north Westminster elections, uh, would be a good place to to begin. Personally, you know, I grew up in a republic. I'm a wee bit biased, but putting on my analyst hat again, um, I remind myself that um, Arthur Griffiths and other illustrious leaders of the past were willing to compromise on the actual form of the relationship with London in order to move towards what they consider to be something better for their country. And it would probably be good for Wales and Scotland to be to, to bear that in mind and to, to just work towards what they think is good for the country, hand in hand, really, with the population. Lila, this is an incredibly comprehensive book, but with all books of this kind, there are gems left on the cutting room floor. Do you have any stories, anecdotes or factoids that you really wish you could have included? And if so, what's your favourite? Oh, my God. <laughs> I sneaked one or two in. <laughs> I mentioned that that uh, uh, Ian Paisley had been trained as a preacher in Barry, uh, just west of Cardiff. I mentioned that the um, the originator of the name Sinn Féin was a cousin of a uh, of the great unionist leader Carson, uh, and it was full of things like that, and too many to 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 be able to. I think there may be another book in it. Well, well, Lila. I have to say, and this is what I said when I talked about it on Twitter, it is an informative and illuminating history of the politics of Ireland. I strongly recommend all our listeners go out and purchase a copy because, like you said, there are a myriad of amazing little facts, figures, stats, and just the history in general is is brilliant. So thank you so much for, for coming on to speak to us. If people want to hear more from you, where can they find you on Twitter? At Lila Eilish, L-I-L-A-E-I-L-I-S. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you on. If you've enjoyed what you've heard this evening, please don't forget to find us on Twitter and Facebook at Heroith Pod or go to our website www.walespolitics.com. And thank you so much for supporting us with your ears. But if you would like to support us with your wallets, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash Heroith Pod. Thank you for listening to Heroith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review.